Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Doug, and I am an alcoholic. I normally, um, I normally don't scratch like this. You're the best. Um, I normally introduce myself as a recovered alcoholic, but we have such three prestigious people that are doing that. That um, You know, when, I, when I'm um, in Florida, or now I'm up in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, I say, hi, my name is Doug, I'm a recovered alcoholic. You could actually see people, they just, they just like roll their eyes. They roll their eyes. You know, and it's not like we make this stuff up. There's one thing i got to say about the, um, the founding... Fathers and, and one lady who helped write the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, they really did a great job of hiding the word recovered. So they put it on the cover page of our book. <laughs> I actually had a guy from Jacksonville, Florida say, but, hey, son, where, where did you find that word recovered? I'm like, oh, my God. I, I, think he, I thought he was teasing me. And I just kind of opened up the book and went like this because my book's all falling apart. And it says here, it says, how many thousands of men and women have recovered from alcoholism? So what I want to do today is I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. In 45 minutes, if you're ready, I'm going to bring everybody through the 12 steps in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You think I can do it? I can. I have. And I'm going to do that. Okay? And I'm going to show you how I bring people through the steps every Saturday between 10 and 2 with my lovely wife. But first, I'd like to thank Karen and all the people who put this um, who put this wonderful event on. Uh, you all have three phenomenal speakers, and uh, Chris is talking about the meetings and the people in the meetings, and and then uh, Chris was was talking about you know AA as a whole, as a, as a big group, World Service, and then Peter was wrapping it up. I was paying attention to what you all were saying with God. And in which it's all about God. If it wasn't for people like this, when I came in February 1st, 1995, I never would have made it. I come in once, once, and I'm going to I'm going to show you why I come in once. Because I met one of these people here, who brought me through the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay, let's just talk about the word recovered real quick, and then I'm going to go on. I have a package that I bring through my 15 and a half years of sobriety that I've made up and I've stole and copyrighted all of the things all around the United States. And it's the 12 steps in everything on here, in this package here, and all the forms, including the nightly form that I fill out every night. Yes, I do have a life. You're like, dude, you got to get a life. I got a great life, and I'll show you all the forms here as I go through the steps, okay? If you ask me, I will send it to you at dmuir01 at gmail.com, okay? And that's just for the people that are on the tapes. That's the manual. <clears throat> we have recovered and we have cured. In the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it's very clear that we are not cured, Correct. Right? There's 900 people shaking their head yes. Correct, Chris? 900 people? It talks about recovered. It talks about recovered 17 times. It uses the word recovered. And one time, recovering, as Chris R. was talking about, which is in a past tense, third person, recovering, in one of the stories in the back. 17 times, count them. <laughs> That's when I didn't have a life. I did. So 17 times... <laughs> It uses the word recovered. So let's look at the difference, all right? With recovered and cured, we have a symptom and a disease, right? Now, when you're recovered, well, let's start off, let's start off with cured. When you're cured from something, my mother had cancer, right? God rest her soul. But when she had breast cancer, she had the symptoms of breast cancer and she had the disease of breast cancer. Follow me so far? My mother got cured. My mother got cured. Five years later, it was all gone for five years. The symptoms of cancer was gone. The disease of the cancer was gone. She was cured. Now, you have us coming into the rooms, right? 
We work the steps. We go to meetings. We have a home group. And we help others. Okay? The order that I like to say is don't drink. Work the steps. Get a spiritual awakening. Help other work the steps. Get involved in AA. Then go to meetings. I do not come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to stay sober. I just want to pause for the effect. <laughs> I do not come to AA. I come to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to find newcomers. And if you talk to all my, all my sponsors, they say that I kidnapped them. And it's a sales job. And if you don't think Bill Wilson was a salesman, you're absolutely right. It's a sales job. So let's go back to recovered. We have the symptoms and the disease. I work the steps. I have a home group. I bring other people through the steps. I pray and meditate with my wife. I'm going to get into detail with that in, in, uh, in step 11. If you have a significant other, totally recommend it. Okay? So the symptoms for me of alcohol are gone. I own one of the largest nightclub restaurants in Charlottesville, Virginia. Yeah. And, and, and I remember people saying to me, do you have any idea what you're doing? I'm like, well, no, I never really ran a restaurant before, but I think this is going to be well, and it's a good – I was just thinking about it as business. It never entered my mind that I only had six years sobriety. And then I'm opening up this big, huge nightclub that's still open. So we're going to be selling ten, we're celebrating 10 years. Chris has been there. It's absolutely wonderful. It employs 85 people. It's a pillar of the community. And that's what I wanted. Because I don't think about alcohol. If someone told me I was allergic to peanuts and I could make money in a peanut factory, I'd open up one. Okay? Because I'm not going to eat peanuts. Same thing here. My symptoms are gone. So long as, contingent as, I love that book. That's all it keeps saying. You're going to get all these bright stars so long as. You ever notice that in the big book? It just gives you all these promises. So long as. So long as. My symptoms are gone. What happens if I add alcohol to my body? With a vengeance from my understanding. For those relapsers, I don't understand that. Right? But I believe you. When you say it is so painful, when you say it's so humiliating, when you say that it, it just hurts your being, I believe you. I see it. I see it in your faces when you come in. And I'm here to tell you this. You will make a better sponsor than I. Think about this. I don't understand what it's like. I've never felt relapse. I've never experienced relapse. So how do I sympathize? I do. I see it with you, but not to the point where you are. You see what I mean? You'll make such a better sponsor than I ever will because you've experienced the depth of that loneliness that you all tell me about. And I believe you when you say it. i just never done it. And it comes back to these three guys. And if you think traveling the world is easy every weekend, it is exhausting. It's exhausting what these guys do. Every weekend I stop. You know what I mean? I, I, when Chris calls me up, you know, Chris is like the godfather to me. He calls up, you know, hey, I double booked. I'm in Scotland. I'm in Ireland. I'm in Nova Scotia in the wintertime. I never do speeches in the wintertime. You know, and I travel for a living and, and talk and motivate. Um, and so it's, it's, it's guys like this that have changed my life. And thank God, because what happened was Chris is flying back home, so I'm not going to tell any you know, war stories. Okay, so I'll tell a few flying drunk war stories. But otherwise, <laughs> I'm the guy who lost the airplane, and we're going to talk about that later. But for 45 minutes, I want to concentrate on this book, and these guys have, led, ha have left a great foundation for me to come and close the door for anybody in here who thinks that they are not going to drink, go to meetings, and live a happy life. It's, just, it's not going to happen. I haven't seen it, okay? So I want to dispel a lot of things that you all hear in Alcoholics Anonymous. It talks about in the forward to the first edition, we have Alcoholics Anonymous for more than 100 men and women who have recovered. Imagine that. Here we go with that word again. From a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Okay? The mind obsession and the body craving. Let me, show you what a, um, let me show you what a doctor in South Miami Hospital taught me. Did I tell you where they send alcoholic pilots? We go to South Beach. 
in the wintertime. So I'm in South Beach hanging out with all these other alcoholic pilots, and we're, you know, telling each other story. Oh, you know, guys are going like this, and I was telling them, yeah, I'm in Nam, and I was, like, not even born yet. Yeah, I'm upside down, <laughs> flying the F-14, which wasn't even out, <laughs> whatever, telling all kinds of lies. That's what we do. All right, so what the doctor told me was this. My wife, who I want to thank right now in front of you all for allowing me to come here with her. I always tear up when I talk about it. I don't know what the deal is. Uh, for our wedding anniversary. And my wife, Larry. <coughs> Stand up. Okay, I got that out of the way. Now. She's absolutely unbelievable. You know, I, I always say that I don't love my wife. I adore my wife. And, and I'll tell you the story how I met her. Um, the, the, there are some things when you're a captain of an airliner and you're flying international and uh, you get to pick up passengers. So. <laughs> <laughs> she was going to Rome, Italy, and I was a captain. And, uh, and um, yeah, so I'll tell you that story too. So anyway, watch me now. Follow me. I got ADD. Okay. Um, a, a medical doctor, a medical doctor in South Miami Hospital when I was in the Looney Bin, and they, I was in a 28-day program, and they loved me there. I, they kept me in for 72, and I, I was actually in lockdown for 28. <laughs> Woo! So anyway, um, what he says is, when my wife drinks, it comes in as alcohol. It goes into like a, a formaldehyde type of substance, and it gives you the woohoo. You know that? And she gets this, woo, you know, she's from Rome, Italy. She has one glass of wine. Every night she says, Douglas, sir. Everything's an A at the end of it. Douglas, I'm drunk, sir. I'm drunk, sir. Every night. I'm drunk. So one glass of wine. I'm drunk. So her mind says, it's a poison. She's drunk. Shut it off. And she stops drinking. To this day, even our anniversary, I'm like, I don't get it. Okay? So from there, it goes to barley and hops, and it goes to H2O, and then... Hopefully, sooner or later, she goes to the bathroom. That's my wife. Let's talk about the gang. <laughs> we can't show her the handshake. She still thinks it's a handshake in AA. We can't show her the handshake. Has anyone ever heard you've crossed the line? <laughs> Everyone's shaking their head, all 1,000 people. So what happens is, with us, it comes in as alcohol, turns to formaldehyde, and it does a 45-degree angle, and it forms a codeine-like substance in our body, and it gives us the more, the more, the more, and we are restless, irritable, and discontent until it comes here, here, and here. I just thought I was weak. I had no idea about this. I just thought I was weak. Okay? So in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it talks about the mind and body, and it says here that this book to show other alcoholics, and it's squiggly lines after this, you know, it's squiggly lines, italicized. Precisely, is to show us precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. There's a purpose and there's an object. The purpose is to show you precisely, exactly, how we have recovered. And the object is to find a God. And I'll show you that in step two, okay? So if this book is to show you precisely how we have recovered, why... Are we doing it ourselves? I'll do it my way. I'm not ready yet. I, I love when people, you're not ready yet. Really? Well, why don't you please tell me when you will be ready? You know what I mean? When are we ever ready? This book's going to show us precisely how we have recovered. Let me tell you what's going on. When, I'm, when I was a cat, when I upgraded the captain, we have a checklist. First officer says something, I respond. Fuel, plenty. Pretty important. Seatbelt sign on. Smoking sign back then we could smoke in cockpit, you know, big cigars. You would have loved it, Pete. Smoking stogies, going to LA. All right, smoking sign, whatever. On for the people in the back, not us. Right? When I did the checklist, I never, ever, ever made a mistake. Follow me? Now. Put me on a four-day trip. I'm at the end of a four-day. Let's say I'm flying back from Dallas, Texas to Washington, where I was based. 
and I'm just exhausted. I just want to get home. I know in Dallas there's a push at a certain time, and I want to get off that gate because i got to get in front of the push. And I'm with a brand new first officer. So I'd be like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just, go, you call gate. Get off gate. And I'm going, I mean, i got 18,000 hours in this airplane. I spark up the engines. We push back. No checklist. Get to the end of the runway. This actually happened. Get to the end of the runway. Clear for takeoff. Add the throttles. Eh, 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 eh. These big sounds. Guess what happened? I forgot to put the flaps in 5D10. Flaps weren't down. You all would have died. I may have lived, but you all would have died. There's no way we would have made it. So think about that. So I always use that analogy checklist with this book because that's all this book is to me. It was a checklist. Okay? So on February 1st, 1995, when I woke up and I was on Amelia Island and alcohol testing had come in to the airlines, I couldn't make it January. I couldn't figure out my schedule not to drink. And I had a drink. January 4th to steady my nerves before I hopped on a plane to go to Florida to go to Washington to start my trip and what happened I woke up February 1st vomit puke blood I thought I killed somebody bottles everywhere I rolled over and I saw a note it was from my then wife who's a flight attendant imagine that I married a flight attendant and she says you turn out like your father I took the kids and I had my kids were two and three and, and I didn't even know they were gone the, the, the letter was dated three days prior to that because this disease kicked in. And I called up this employee assistance program and these captains came down and they said, you may never fly an airplane again. And they just cut me out and they brought me to Happy Hills where they bring drunk pilots. And a couple of you guys who were running the place, this guy, Dr. Wolfson, was sitting there with his feet up on the desk and he looked at me, and they flew my wife in, and he goes, you're an angry little man. <laughs> I could see you doing that. <laughs> and I looked at him, and I said, F you. And I said the word, and I grabbed my wife by the hand. I'm walking out, and that son of a, he didn't move. His feet were just up there, and he looked at me, and I'm about ready to grab the doorknob, and he says, you touch that effing doorknob, I'll make sure you don't even fly a kite. <laughs> uh, doesn't he understand i got to graduate this class? Because the FAA wasn't going to give me back my license. Right? This big guy comes up to me. Big, big, burly guy comes up to me. And I'm in this room, and they, they took my wife away. I don't know why you separate us so fast, but anyway. So I'm like, everything's spinning, and this big guy goes, get on your knees. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> No tickle bells. Uh. <laughs> so he looked at me and goes, you really are an idiot. Get on your knees. He goes, we're going to say a prayer. I'm like, no, you don't understand. I'm not really, I don't believe in this. God. <laughs> he goes, all right, pack your bag. And I'm like, oh, that's it? Oh, well, that was easy. Just you don't believe in God, you don't have to hang out with you guys in these rehabs. So I grab my bag, go to the door. He goes, get out. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean get out? Everyone's trying to throw me out of this place. I'm like, what do you mean? I got to graduate. I literally said I got to graduate. <laughs> That's still embarrassing to this day. And I made, I made amends to that, to that rehab. I did. I flew down there and made amends. I was just... Anyway, so, um, so he made me get on my knees in the hallway, you know, and, and start saying prayers. And I said something like, you know, God, thank you for nothing, you SOB. <laughs> just spewed. He goes, good. It's the beginning. And, I, you know, I haven't missed. I have not missed. Morning or night, I have not missed. Um, and, then, and then I got to, um, and then my 72 days was up, and I got back to the island. Um, it talks in the preface here. It says, because this book, ladies and gentlemen, if you can't see, it's, uh, this book is the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It says, because this book has become the basic text. So what's a textbook? A textbook is something that needs to be taught, right? I know Chris Schroeder very well. He is off the hook smart, and I'm not joking about that. So if I was to give Chris my 737 flight manual and say, Chris, here, read the 737 flight manual. Tell me what you think in 30 days. How many of us have sponsors that say that? And then in 30 days, he comes up and he wrote it. He goes, well, I, you know, I said, shut up. Just get in the airplane. Come on, we're going to L.A. Spark it up. He'd be like, what? 
So I'm in rehab, and I have this guy who's talking beautiful. He sounds great. I'm like, hey, will you be my whatever they call that? He says, yeah, I'm out of here. Read this book. Tell me what you think. Well, I'm in a padded room. I have nothing else to do. I read. So I read the 164 pages. I call him up. He goes, you're done? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you know, I, I'm a math major. I'm an aerospace engineer by education, so I don't know much about writing. But this is poorly written, and that guy, Bill, is a loser. <laughs> and he says, read it again. Tell me what you think. Okay. Maybe this is the dance that we do in this whatever I'm in. So we're doing this dance, and finally I'm like, dude, I'm not going to read this anymore. You know, what was he saying? He says, I don't know the book. Why don't you tell me? When you come into my house, my wife will, and I will sit there on Saturdays from 10 to 2, waiting for people to come over our house in Florida, and we get knocks on the door, and I bring them through the steps. If it's a woman and they feel uncomfortable telling me the fifth, my wife will bring them through the fifth. But I have, I, they don't do any reading. They sit there, they highlight, and they outline. Because I'm doing two things. I'm helping them to achieve a spiritual awakening through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I do not want to reinvent. And I want to teach them how to pass the message on. Right? Will we miss stuff? Absolutely. There's no doubt. That's why we got a 10th step. So we do that every night. Okay? Now, it states here. I got so many tabs over here, it's just kill me. I love this. Let's talk about permanent sobriety. Bring that up in the rooms. Do you know the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about permanent sobriety twice? Try that and go like this. <laughs> because it's, cut. it's all going to be about me. It's all going to be about me. It says here, this seemed to prove that one alcoholic could affect another as no non-alcoholic could. It also indicated that strenuous work, giving up a Saturday, flying all over the world like these guys do, strenuous work, one alcoholic with another, was vital to permanent, forever, forever. Why be afraid to say it? So long as, so long as we do this. Recovery, unity, and service. And, and this is how I follow my sobriety. Every week, wow, did I do that? <laughs> oh, I didn't know where the circle stopped. There it goes. <laughs> right? As long as I do this, I'm in the center of the triangle, and I'm safe and protected by the universe. Got it? I'm going to explain this in detail in step 10. I just had an ADD moment, and I wanted to show that to you because I guess I can. Um, what I want to show you is, let's talk about numbers. I love numbers. Numbers are my friend. Numbers, people are like, why, did you, why, did you, why didn't you pick an, pick an easier degree in aerospace engineering? Because it was the only thing I could do drunk. You know, I can't read and I can't write. I have, and this is embarrassing, and I'll tell you, I'll lay myself open. I have a full-time editor on staff, and nothing goes off my desk unless she corrects it. And I still see her to this day like, and she's always correcting it because I can't spell and I can't write. So let's just get that thing straight. Now, it talks about on page uh, XX, it says, of alcoholics who came in and really tried, I mean, like, really, really tried, 50% got sober at once. That's huge. Think about that. It says here, got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up into some relapses. That's a 75% sobriety ratio, folks. What happened? When I came in here, I wanted to study your manual, as I called it. I didn't call it the big book. I called it a manual. Because everything in the airlines is a manual. I wanted to know your policies and procedures guide. Because I needed to know how to get around the contract. See, that's what I did. I was a big union guy. I knew how to get around contract. Every time I go to penetrate your policies and procedures guide, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I kept on finding out some stuff. And I was like, whoa, this was like a revolving door. I mean, after about 60 to 90 days, there was only one other person pilot sober with me, and we started with 35. It was just, it was, it was mind-boggling. I'm like, huh. Maybe this isn't working. 75% got sober at once. What happened? What happened? 
we got watered down. We got the don't drink and go to meetings. So guess what I did? I didn't drink and I went to meetings. And on the 90th day, I was picking up a trinket. I don't know what color trinkets we got in Florida, but we got door prizes for not drinking. It's like, you know, giving a cowboy with hemorrhoids a door prize for not riding a horse, you know. Here. Cool. I think it was a green chip or something like that. So anyway, I got this door prize, and it's 90 days, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to go out drinking. I didn't want to be an airline pilot. I didn't want to fly every other Tuesday and make all this money anyway. I just want to be unemployed and drink. And that's what the God's honest truth. Because if I touch one anything, I'm done. No license, no kite flying, nothing. All right? So after 72 days, they let me out of the loony band. I go back to this place. I'm not drinking. I'm going to meetings. I'm not drinking. I'm going to meetings. I'm hanging out with guys like this, and I'm out hearing it. But I'm hearing a lot of not drinking and going to meetings. On my 90th day, I'm thinking, I'm going to get that green chip, and I'm going to go to Five Point Liquors. Five Point Liquors is the best invention in Florida. It's a drive through liquor store. So when you're too drunk to get out of your car, you drive through. So the whole left side of my car is always, oh, here comes that pilot guy again. And I'd have all my stripes on, my hat on crooked. You know, because I'm knocking people off the jetway. I got to get, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm running down the jetway after a four-day trip. I'm like, you know what I mean? And I get to the Exxon station and, Right? The disease kicks in. And then I drink a 12-pack of Tall Boys on a 30-minute drive to an island. And then I go to the drive through liquor store. Here's a drunk pilot. That's what they used to call me. Imagine that, the drunk pilot. So anyway, I was going to leave this meeting, and I was going to drink. And as I'm running out the door, this guy from Hoboken, New Jersey, steps in my way. And he says, listen. He says, you're acting a little more weird than usual. <laughs> he says, so if you're about ready to go out, do not say that AA failed you because you have not worked the program of recovery. Well, he was one of the sons of bitches that kept pulling me to all these jails and meetings and halfway hooker houses or whatever, halfway houses, whatever you call them. And I'm, I'm like, you son, are you kidding me? I'm going to four meetings a day and blah, 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 blah. He goes, yeah, and you're leading meetings and you sound like an idiot. And he says, and you're a fellowship guy. He says, but if you want to know the program of recovery, come over to my house on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 o'clock. He says, you're late once, don't show up. You lie to me once, you're done. Got it? I'm like, you little son of Yeah, I got it. Get out of my way. And I get to the light and I see Five Point Liquors and I swear to God, I don't know what happened. The car went left. And I said, I'll wait. I'll wait to Tuesday. And I brought this just big book to his house, and we sat down, and he just started going over this big book and going over this big book, and he started showing me stuff that I never heard because I was hearing all kinds of crazy stuff. You know, Peter asked, what, what really, and he says, don't read out of the book, but I'm going to, uh, you know, what is the definition of, um, of, of alcoholism? Is it that I got four DWIs? Four. Now, being the self-proclaimed rocket scientist I am, I figured out after the fourth one what happened. I have to stop driving. <laughs> so I stopped driving, and I moved to Hoboken. And, and, I, and I, got, I got a hostage, and I, I moved in, and I'd go on a four-day trip, and I'd, I'd go to Newark Airport. I'd ride a jump seat. we get these little seats up in front of the cockpit for other union guys. And, and I'd fly to Washington and do my trip and come back. And I would call up these taxi guys and be like, hey, man, it's that pilot. Because oh, I was a fat tipper if they came with a bottle of whiskey, man. Yeah, I'd come out. And they'd be like, you know, trays and drinks. And we'd be hanging out. And I'd be crossing over the one and nine, going back to Hoboken. Yeah, you know, my girlfriend's like, how are you drunk? Weren't you flying? Yeah, whatever. You know, minor details. It says here, we believe, we, the first 100 people of Alcoholics Anonymous, so suggest a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy, that the phenomenon of craving to this class never occurs in my wife, never occurs in the average temperate drinker, ever, 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 okay? So that makes me an alcoholic. 
It talks. It says here. It says that um, they are restless, irritable, and discontent unless they can again experience a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. Drinks which they see others take with impunity. That used to piss me off. I'd watch my friends and they'd stop, and I'm like, how? Or no, better. Why? <laughs> why? Why would you do that? It says after they have succumbed to the desire again, the mental obsession. Anyone ever get that mental obsession? I swear to God. I swear to God, uh, after after a huge two, three-day binge, you could hook me up to a lie detector test saying, are you drinking tonight? No. And it goes, And I guess what happens at 4 o'clock? Maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe one drink won't be too bad. And then by 5 o'clock, I'm just dancing on the bar. Right? It says, once they come to desire again, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops. It's the phenomenon of, phenomenon of craving. It's not that you live under a bridge. It's not that I lost every job. It's not that I have four DWIs. It's that I have the phenomenon of craving, which makes it virtually impossible for me to stop. And if that is a true statement, the only thing that's going to take away that is God. Now we got a problem. Because I'm an atheist. So what are we going to do? Well, mathematically, I was able to show people how a God does not exist. I used to study how a God would not exist. It's exhausting. And then I worked the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And after I completed the ninth step, I got a spiritual awakening that was the most embarrassing moments in my life, and I'll tell you about it. See, I keep on leading you on so you have to stay in your seats and stay here without going to the bathroom because you might miss that one. <laughs> Check this out. It says... Can you imagine walking into an AA meeting and saying, Hi, my name's Doug, I'm recovered, and I have solved the drink problem. <laughs> Chapter 2, there is a solution. It says, nearly all have recovered, they have solved the drink problem. So I have these little SOB sponsees running around saying, Hey, my name's Billy Bob. Doug told me I solved my drink problem, and I'm like, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> I come back from the trip, and you know what I mean? It says, the tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. Can any one of us here, can we get five of us together finding we're going to go have dessert? Because I am having dessert today, by the way. But we couldn't agree on that. It's saying that every one of them have discovered a common solution. We have a way out on which we can absolutely agree. Think about that and upon which we can join in brotherly, harmonious action. This is the great news this book brings us, carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. I thought I'd just read that because that's a, that's a little point. People, and if you're in here, you don't have to raise your hands, but if you're telling people don't drink going to meetings, please don't. Well, let's just make a pact today. We'll stop saying that. Just us. 1,100 people. Stop! Did I spell that right? It's bad when I look to my Italian wife and it's like, hey, honey, how do you spell it? She's Italian. I mean, right off the boat. We, the first 100 people of Alcoholics Anonymous feel the elimination of drinking is but a beginning. Don't drink, go to meetings. Okay, what's the end of this story? Just don't drink, go to meetings. I used to love these guys. They'd be like... They'd sound so good, and, you know, I worked the steps daily in my life, and I'd be like, whoop, whoop, right next to him. How do you do that? Well, I just don't drink, 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 and I don't think, 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 and I, you know, oh, he's saying all these slogans, and I'm looking over his shoulder, and I'm like, he just said every slogan on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I take the sock out of my ass and put it in my mouth, or my ear, whatever. You know that sock one? I'm like, give me a brain. So anyway, there I was, there I was, right? Inverted, ding dang. And um, there's three types of drinkers. So as I'm going through these three types of drinkers, this is a good one. So I want everybody here, Valeria, please don't raise your hand. Ready? We're going to go through the three types of drinkers, and let's see if you're that moderate drinker. Let's start off. Have little trouble giving up liquor entirely. <laughs> Rose! I'm going to give everybody your address. <laughs> it's Rose at 975-555. Moderate drinker. Have little problem giving it up at time. So I just kind of took that one and put that to the side. 
Okay? Then it says there's a hard drinker. A hard drinker may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. That happened with me between, like, let's say, 14 and maybe 24. Um, and then it says, if a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, changing of environment, or a warning from a doctor becomes operative, this man can circle, stop, circle, moderate. Moderate. <laughs> no. So the moderation is not happening. And let me tell you why. So as an airline pilot, I have to go, and at this time I'm a first officer, so uh, I have to go through a flight physical every year. Captains have to go there every six months. And these flight physicals are, are very expensive. Fingers flying over, it's just not pretty. So, <laughs> so they're taking a blood test, and uh, the guy comes back to me. I'm 32 years old, and he goes, golly, your white blood count is high. Not good for you medical people in here, right? Meaning something's happening with the liver. Or I learned that if you have the flu, when you're trying to fight off a disease or a bacteria, the white blood count will increase. So being the guy I am, I looked at him, I just got the <coughs> flu. <laughs> he goes, oh, okay. Writes me out my medical. I'm good for another year. I'm like, woo, writing it out. I get a call. I'm in Texas. First officer in New York? Yes. First officer in New York? Yeah, we love calling each other captain, captain, admiral, admiral, captain, whatever. <laughs> I'm a pilot. <laughs> so first officer in New York? Yes, scheduler Kim. <laughs> the doctor wants to see you in Crystal City, Washington. I'm like, okay. She goes, you're a positive space. And in the union, we're positive space first class. Woohoo! And I'm pay protected. So I'm like going to the airport, hey, lizards, I'm out of here. I'm paper protected. I'm going back. And I go back, and I'm, I walk into Crystal City. I walk into this doctor, and he goes to me, and there's a nurse there. She's cleaning something, and he looks at me, and he's not smiling. And he says, um, he says, first officer, he says, I don't care what you tell me. He says, you have a serious drinking problem, and you have cirrhosis of the liver. So I sit back on those little tables, you know. And I'm thinking, how am I getting out of this? Not that he told me I'm about ready to die. <laughs> Little problem. The big problem is, how am I getting out of this? So I'm like, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> oh, my father just died for the ninth time this year. And... Uh, uh, so I said, and, uh, you know, if, 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 I was, if I was to continue to drink, how long would I have? <laughs> the lady drops what she had, and they looked at me. She goes, you are effing kidding. I'm like, the ballpark figure. <laughs> I cracked myself up. So anyway. He said 14 years, 15 years max. I'm thinking 32 for, whoa! So I'm like ready to jump out of my skin. I got 15 years. I was so excited. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, yeah. All right, all right, so what, what do you want me to do? Go see the employee assistance program. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm too, yeah. Uh, I know I'm going to the Crystal City Bar and my buds are there and it's a Friday and I'm buying everybody drinks because I got 15 years left. And I go walking in, I got 15 years, and we're like, wow, and I'm buying drinks for everybody. I got the stripes on, woo! So, having said that, a doctor told me I'm dying, and I went out and celebrated, I'm not a hard drinker. <laughs> Do you see where we all just came right back there? All right. Follow along with me now, folks. I still got time. But what about the real alcoholic? The real alcoholic, me, moi. <laughs> yeah, you. He may start off as a moderate drinker. I did 14 to 15. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker between 19 and 24. But at some stage of his drinking career, folks, if you're calling drinking a career, think about it. <laughs> we might have a problem here. What do you do? Drink.
As some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts drinking. I used to love those people. Ah, it's the first drink that gets you drunk. I'm like, loser. 18 and a fifth. I count it. And then I black out. I kind of you know, I measure bottles. and It was 18 and a fifth. Yeah, that was the word for me. I had no idea what he was talking about. I drink and I set that terrible cycle in motion. Okay? Do we all follow that one? It says here, um, I love this part. There is a solution. There is a solution. Really? There's a solution. None of us knows this because you don't read the book. There's a solution. This is the, there's a solution. Almost none of us like self-searching. What's that? Steps four and ten. The leveling of pride. When you come in here to Alcoholics Anonymous and you admit you're powerless over something, that's pretty ego deflating, right? So that's step one. The confession, step five, of shortcomings six and seven which the process requires for its successful consummation. So if you haven't done the process, your chances of this successful consummation is nil to none, as these guys have been talking about. You follow me? So I say to the newcomer and chronic, or newcomer and chronic relapsers, the good news is you've never worked the process. The bad news is you've never worked the process. And you're going to keep going, and you're going to keep going, and you're going to keep going. I've seen it time and time and time again. When, therefore, we are approached by those whom the problem has been solved. When we are approached by those who the problem has been solved. If these guys haven't worked the, the steps, you're just being approached by a guy who wants to take a walk. Think about it. If when we were approached by where the problem has been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple... A kit of spiritual tools, the 12 steps, laid at our feet. We found much of heaven, and we are rocketed into the fourth dimension. And I don't need to go over that again, because I have been, and Pete has explained that one. Step one, we learned that we were fully conceited. We had to learn that we were fully conceited to our innermost self, our intermost self. Not to my wife, not to my family, not to the airline guys, to my innermost self that I was alcoholic. This was the first step of recovery. The delusion... That we are like other people, presently has to be smashed. They don't say broke, smash. Smash, you cannot put back together. Broke, you can. All right? So everybody follow me so far, or am I going too fast? This is my favorite one, and it's going to drive me to drink. This is the powerless one. Powerless. Are we powerless over people, places, and things? And you better say no. All right. What are we powerless over? I love this. I'm powerless over people. Places and things. I just found out what the thing was. I'll, I'll study to you. People. Powers over people. I had a New Jersey family. Well, we called it ball breaking. I, I lost my, a lot of my accent, but we were like ball break each other. You know what I mean? I lost my father to alcoholism at the age of 54. He turned yellow and died. Threw us to the liver. My brother died with a needle in his foot at the age of 21. So now I'm taking up the slack. And so uh, I got sober. I was one year sober. I, I really started falling in love with myself, me, because I was like, wow, you taught me how to do that. And I was, I was sober, and I worked the steps, and I'm helping people. My life was unbelievable. And my sister said something to me that cut through me like a knife because now I feel good about myself. And I looked at her, and I said, listen to me. And I pulled everybody together. I said, if I've ever treated you like this, I apologize. It will never happen again because I love you. But if you ever talk to me like that again, you're gone. Because I love myself, we all should love ourselves. Let's stop carrying the cross. I trudge this road. Trudge, re moving forward with purpose. Okay? Places. If I don't like a place, Florida. I was down in Florida for all those years because my flight attendant ex-wife wanted to continue flying the friendly skies. And that's fine. She could do that. But I had retired from the airlines, and I was not going to have my kids have any more nannies, and I went down there, and I took them through school. June 6th, my son graduated. June 7th, I was out. <laughs> my kids are calling me up. Hey, Dad, I haven't seen you. Who? I was just static. Clank. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> they're both in college now. They're, they're wonderful. Things. My IT department keeps giving me these phone gadgets like I know what the hell I'm doing. I have no idea how to work technology. And finally, I just threw it out the window, and I felt better. 
I am not powerless over these things. I'm powerless what alcohol does to my body. Do we get it? Got it? Good. Step two. This was a good one. Remember, did I tell you all I was atheist? Yes. So my sponsor comes over to the house and he says, we needed to ask ourselves the one short question. Do I now believe or am even willing to believe that there's a power greater than myself? As soon as a man can say that he does believe or is willing to believe, we emphatically assure him that he's on his way. And I said, no, I do not believe. He said, all right. So instead of being one of these sponsors who don't know what the hell they're talking about, he says, I'll tell you what, we're just going to keep on moving forward. But do you believe that you have stayed sober for 92 days by the help of me and us, meaning AA? I'm like, yeah. He goes, let's move forward. And that's what we did. Because he knew, having had a spiritual awakening as the singular result of these steps, that I was going to get it. He put a lot of money on that one, buddy. I'll tell you what, I wasn't going to do it. Now, you know, we were talking about this, and I love this one. We were talking about um, Prozac. Or was it you, Prozac? One of you speakers were talking about Prozac. I was sitting at a table once in Charlottesville, Virginia. There was 10 of us. Eight were on Prozac. I'm like, what am I missing? Share. <laughs> and I wasn't on Prozac. Eight people were on Prozac. Folks, if you're on medication, you need to be on medication. What I tell people, I just ask them, are you on medication? Yes. Stay on medication. Until you finish the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you start your prayer and your meditation, and you start bringing people through the steps. Because what's going to happen, it's going to start messing with your mind because you're going to be fine. Well, I'm depressed. You're drinking a gallon of vodka a day. Of course you're depressed. Stop it. Let's start working on the spiritual, the inner condition that these guys have been talking about. So I'm going to walk into a doctor. I'm like, doctor. <laughs> this is on page 52, by the way. Doctor, I'm having trouble with my personal relationship. I can't control my emotional nature. I'm a prey to misery and depression. I can't make a living. I have a feeling of uselessness. I'm full of fear. I'm unhappy. I can't be a help. If he doesn't put me on Prozac, He's committing malpractice. Think about this. All this is is a dry drunk. Work the steps. Every time I see somebody work the steps, there was one guy who did not get off the medication. And he's seriously uh, uh, Henry T. And he's still sober 11 years, and he's on some serious, serious, serious medication. But he's fine. He's level. He's good. I mean, it's so bad he can't work. But he's one out of thousands. I just wanted to bring that up to you and Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Well, wouldn't you be interested what the path is? If someone said to you, really, have I seen a person fail who has played this stock market, wouldn't you want to listen to the stock market guy, right? Rarely have I seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed the path. So the question is, why is this thing falling down? But besides that, the question is, what's the path? In my studies, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I got Bill off to my right, and he scares the hell out of me because he corrected me once. But I'm going to go off the limb. <laughs> the path, let me write it over here so I can look at him and see if he can. The path is the big book, and the path is the steps. That's the path from my readings and what I learned. That's what they were considering, the path. Okay. Rarely, rarely have I seen a person make it past five months. Do you know we're down to about 8 and 10%? Eight, ten percent, and I, I just actually wrote that. Uh, yeah, got it right here. Um, I printed it off. Uh, it says here as the last program, we're between five and ten percent recovery rate, depending on the studies that you read. Five and ten percent, folks. What happened? We're not following the path. We're doing this not drink, go to meetings thing. You know? Oh, you went out, cover. Give me a little love. Give me sugar. <laughs> Some sugar. I'll give you sugar. Come over to my house on Saturday between ten and two. I'll give you sugar. Smacky. All right. Step three. I love step three because when you finish, when you're done with step three, it says, voicing it without reservation, this was only a beginning. How many people have seen this? One, two, three, drink. One, two, three, drink. The dance. They don't go to four. They do one, two, three, drink. One, two, three, drink. One, two, three, drink. Because it's only a beginning here. Though if honestly and humbly made, an effect, sometimes a strong one, will happen. So I have people get to their knees with me, and we say the third step prayer. And sometimes I watch them break down, you know, and sometimes we just press forward. So what happened with me? My sponsor came over. He got on his knees, and I'm like, oh, my God, what are you doing? Get off your – I'm looking around. I'm in my house. I'm looking around like I'm embarrassed. This guy's on his knees in my house. 
I'm the guy who used to poop his pants in a bar and go back the next day with not even an inkling of embarrassment. Walk out of the bathroom with pee all over the place. Ah! You know, no embarrassment. But a guy gets to my knees in my house, I'm turning red. I'm freaking out, okay? So he said to me, will you make a decision right now to do the rest of the steps? And I said, I could do that. Do you see where he's moving me? Do you see how we're moving forward? Then he got to step four over here, and we started talking about step four. I wrote 22 pages of step four. Do you know what I do now? I have you in my house being somewhat of a sales guy. I mean, when you start a new company or buy a company, you're trying to sell something to somebody. Always we're doing it. When I have them here and we go to the four step, that's good for you. It means you have 15 minutes left. Right? When we go to the four step over here and we start working on resentments, fears, sex. I always love that one. And then I even have the harms done others in here. Okay? I look at him right across the table. You think I'm going to let him go home? I got a sales pitch here. I got this guy. He's not leaving my house. I'm doing the four-step right in front of him now. And I say, okay, you got the resentments? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you know. I'm ready. And it's blank. And I got my pen. And I'm going to do it for him. And I got the pen. And I'm ready. I was like, okay. Resentment. Tell me what you came here not to tell me. And they're like, and the bottom lip starts quivering. And the tears start coming. And all of a sudden, they tell me it. They tell me the thing. Folks, we all got the thing. We all got the thing. I had the thing. And it happened in Knoxville, Tennessee, 1984. And it was not a good thing. And on those 22 pages, guess what? I left it out. But my sponsor, my sponsor not being an idiot, looked at me. He goes, all right. He used to call me genius. And I don't think it was loving. I'm like, yeah, genius. You know, because I used to philosophize Okay, do you know why you're doing this step? I'm like, yeah, because you told me to. <laughs> no, genius. It's because the first reason why we're going to do this. If we skip this vital step, we may not overcome drinking. Nine times, I'm going to read to you. I'm going to paraphrase and skip some. Nine times, it's going to say, are you sure you're not leaving out anything? These guys weren't idiots. So I'm reading the fifth step in chapter six. And it says, time after time, newcomers have tried to keep to themselves certain facts about their lives. He looked at me straight in my soul. And he says, are you leaving anything out? And I'm like, no. <laughs> Lied right to his face. He says, all right, we're good with that. He says, trying to avoid this humbling experience, too. Are you trying to avoid this humbling experience by leaving something out? And I'm like, no. And now I'm tapping the foot. And he's like, what is that noise? And I'm like, <laughs> he says, okay, that's cool. They have turned to easier methods. Are you turning to easier method by leaving something out? And I'm like, no. <laughs> All right, so then we go on and on and on. And the ninth time he looked at me, he says, listen, genius, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you one more time, one more time. And then if you want to let this thing go and you want to hold something back, I'll, I'll believe you, whatever. But you're wasting my time. Your chances of sobriety are nil. He says, so once we have taken this step, withholding nothing. Are you withholding anything? And I'm like, yeah, since 1984, <laughs> National Tennessee, and women, and guys, ah! And I went, oh, my God, I'm thinking I just told this guy. And I'm looking at him, like, waiting for him to look at me like, you're a freak. And he was sitting back. He's laughing. He goes, Phew, hey, nothing. This guy's from Hoboken, remember? <laughs> <laughs> I know about Jersey people. So anyway, he goes, that ain't nothing. He goes, let me tell you my thing. And he told me his thing. And I'm like, holy shit, you're sick. <laughs> That's a true story. That's where a sponsor comes in. And then I returned home, and it's telling me to be alone for an hour. <clears throat> and having ADD, I was there for three minutes thinking I was there for a lifetime. <laughs> and I, I took this book down from my, the shelf, and I, I read the first five proposals. What I do is when I have people there, I do it. I go back, and I read the first five proposals. And, you know, when I read the first five proposals, the first thing I wanted to, um, I forgot to tell you, um, is after we do the, um, after we do the uh, third step, I love the way people say that there aren't any time frames here. After you do the third step, it's, I forgot to say this. It says, next we launched. How fast is launched? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, my, my uh, roommate from college, I got accepted into the Navy pilot training, and he got accepted into the Air Force. And two weeks before I went to Navy fighter pilot training, I, I um, was hired on by the airlines, which was unheard of back then. 
He went into the Air Force. He just did one of the F-15 flybys in the Super Bowl, Billy, Billy Bear. He's just a, a wonderful human being. I called up Billy. I said, Billy, how fast is launch? He goes, dude, they strap your ass into these two jets, and it's like you're just sitting on these. And he's like, whoo. So then I put that here, and it's like, next we launched. And on a course of vigorous action, the first step is which is a personal house cleaning. A personal house cleaning. Next we launched. Then we get to the fifth step over here, and it says, now. All right. You just did the fourth step, so the next word is now. These are about ready to be cast out. This requires action on our part. Do you see that? No time frame, just launch now, whatever. I could be making I could be making all this stuff up. Now, once you're done with the fifth step, it gives you another one. It says, if we can answer to our satisfaction and ask you three questions in the fifth step, and if you answer yes to all those questions, it says here, we then. Launch now, then, then meaning what? Like now? I just want, I'm not, a, I'm not very bright when it comes to English. <laughs> so we got the then. Then we're doing step six, okay? Then we're at step seven. I get everybody down to their knees, and I read the seven-step prayer, okay? It used to say, humbly upon our knees. That step used to say that, okay? Uh, we don't do that anymore. And uh, it also ends with an amen, okay? It leaves it open in the third-step prayer, and then amen, the seventh-step prayer means, so be it. Okay, I'm done, it's over, so be it. Everything I just looked at, I looked at it, it's over, it's done. Now, let's start cleaning up the wreckage of our past. So, then it goes, it says, after the seventh step, the next word says, now, no time frames, now. So I'm bringing this guy through the steps and his head's just spinning. And we're going and we're moving. And it says, now we need more action without which uh, uh, we find that faith without works is death. Let's look at steps eight and nine. This was a changing point in my life, <clears throat> um, and I, I never make it through without, without tearing up on this. <clears throat> so what happened was, uh, being an airline pilot, which really sucked back then because I could make direct demands everywhere, literally. <laughs> and I wanted to write GSO because I thought my you know, sponsor was abusing me. I'm like, why can't I write a letter? Make a phone call because you can get your ass on an airplane. Where are you going next week? So I was getting on airplanes every week. Every week, making amends. Well, they were getting so bad, I was getting so nervous that I started shaking and forgetting what I was going to say. So, what did I do in my analness? And I mean that with all the utmost respect for you anal people. Is that I wrote a sheet. And the sheet is the ninth step form. And it was a card. Front of the card and back of the card. I put the person's name, what I did to them. How I have to make amends to them. And I go knocking on the door. And the girl would open up, the girl, of course, would open up the door. What do you want? I'm here to make an amends to you. Uh, I know I have done you harm. And they'd be like, get in here. And, and I know I'm, uh, <laughs> sit down. And then I caused you harm. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so uh, I made amends. And uh, I, I was a thief and a liar. I know you don't believe me. <laughs> and I, I used to steal from the neighbors in my mother's neighborhood. <clears throat> so my sponsor said to me when we were writing out the A-step, <clears throat> he says, all right, well, this is what you're going to do, and you're going to go you know, pay them back, and you're going to knock on their door. And I'm like, whoa, cowboy, whoa, 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 we're not going to do that. I'll give them cash and a card and give it to them. And he's like, no, uh-uh, no. And he talked about it in the big book, when you have to make, <clears throat> when you have to make amends, and you're not sure what to do, you can always go back to the big book. And it says here, before you take a drastic action, I'm like, Jesus. does this big book have everything? Before you take a drastic action, which might implicate other people, I'm like, mother, neighborhood, never going to happen. So I call up my mom, I get, a, I get a meeting together with my sisters, and I put on my suit. Now, I, of course, I had a uniform, so I always had one suit. It was a gray suit with a red tie and a white shirt. That's how I made my amends. Why? Don't know. To this day, I don't know. But every time I made amends, I wore that gray suit. Doug's doing good. He's wearing a suit. Nice red tie. Right? It's from the 60s, but I'm still wearing this suit. <laughs> so I get everybody together in the house, and I say, listen, I don't know how to tell you this, but um, I used to steal from the, all the whole neighborhood. I'm crawling around. And my mother's like, oh, my God. And my sister's like, really? Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I, I need to make amends to them. If, if, I will, let me make this clear, if it's going to harm you, I'm not going to do it, because you know me. My heart's here. You know me. 
I'm going to take one for the team. I'm not going to do it. Well, what happens if you do do it, my mother says. I'm like, supposedly, I'll, I'll stay sober forever. <laughs> and they're all like, oh, yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. I'm like, shit. <laughs> Hi, Mrs. Sullivan. Little Dougie. They call me Little Dougie. I don't know why, but... Little Dougie makes good airline pilot type, whatever. So I make my first events to her. She just like almost keels over. And then I go to this other place and this other place. And by the time I'm done, I get back to Washington. I'm like, there is no way in hell I am going back. I'm like complaining to you guys. These guys were tough down there in Charlottesville. And they're like, oh, really? where are you going next week? Oh, my All right, so I had to finish up with New Jersey. Now, I had a bunch of bench warrants out for my arrest <laughs> for the state. And I uh, still, I'm still not believing in God yet. And, um, but I'm feeling part of the program. And <clears throat> I, I called up um, the airline I was with. And I said, I, I got to go do jail time. They're like, I was like, hello. He's like, are you kidding me? He was the chief pilot. I was like, yeah, I'll tell you later when I get out. He says, all right, call the union. I called the union. They're like, what? Maybe we could get that taken care of. I'm like, no, no, you don't need to take care of things. I'll take care of it. And so I, I walk into this, uh, I walk into the state trooper place, and I surrender myself. <clears throat> There's this big guy behind the counter. He goes, "What do you want?" And I'm like, blah, 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 blah. "Yeah, I like pee myself, walk around like this." I had this little bag, and I had like a hanger. <laughs> Where do I hide my clothes? <laughs> and he he goes, "Oh, Mr. Muir, we've been waiting for you." Click click, and I'm like. Bleh. So I'm sitting in this room, this young guy comes walking in, I'm, I think I was 33 at that time, and this guy's in his early 30s, and he goes, what are you doing, do you have any idea how much paperwork you just cost me? I'm like, dude, I'm in handcuffs, you think I care? You know? He says, why are you doing this? And I told him, I said, I'm a part of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a very prestigious group. <laughs> <clears throat> to be a member, you got to do a lot of damage, so... And he's looking up my rap sheet like, woo, you're good at this. And um, he says, I, I, we've never had this. I don't know what to do. I'm like, well, can you figure it out? And he says, yeah, yeah, I'll be right back. And here we go with ADD. So I think I'm in there for a week. And it was probably 15 minutes. And he comes across the table. And he goes, read this. And I'm like, like he was going to smack me up the head. I'm like, <laughs> and I see this number. Boop, six digits. So I'm thinking to myself, it says in the big book, we make the best deal we can, right? <laughs> so I said, how about I pay you $250 a month for the first four months, and we upgrade it to $500 a month, and in my contract, I'm going to get a pay raise, and then I can move it up. And I had it all figured out in my head, right? And the guy goes, are you, are you negotiating with me? You're in handcuffs. And I'm like, I'm just being realistic. And we signed the document, and I made my last payment to him and everybody else, June 2nd, 2002. So it took me seven years to pay everything back, okay? I was paying $5 a week cash, $10 a week, $20. I upgraded the captain. I started making money. I started paying off everything. But I did not buy one thing. Well, I, I bought an Amtrak train station and put a restaurant in there. But besides that, <laughs> <laughs> little Amtrak train station. I lived in my 900-square-foot place, did I not? I had my 89 Bonneville, and that was it. No vacation, nothing. I did it, and I paid off all that debt. Then when I did that, I bought a Mac Daddy car and a beautiful house. But for that, because I knew that if I, uh, if I did it, I was stealing from them, the people, and I did not want to do that. I made that amends. I called up my mother. I'm like, I'm out of jail. She goes, what do you mean you're out of jail? I'm like, I, they didn't put me in. They let me out. And I'm crying. She goes, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. Come pick me up. Get me out of here. So she got me out of there. I was like, just drop me off at the airport. Newark. And I go on this airline, United Airlines. As you know, I'm not flying for them. And the union guys get to go in the front of the cockpit, and we get the right jump seat. And the guy goes, yeah, just go sit back in first class. And I'm in first class, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting next to this old lady. It came over me. I was equal with the universe. I have, I have made amends to everybody. I had no more fear in my life. It was done. And this overwhelming God consciousness came over me, and I needed one of God at that moment on that airplane, and I started crying. I want God. <laughs> so this old lady's patting my head. The funny thing that's coming by, she's like, wait, he wants God. I want God. 
So they, this way that walks up to the cockpit is like, that pilot back there wants God, and the captain, I hear him go, give it to him. <laughs> Bad. I get off that airplane, and I just start buying books and buying all this, and, and people are knocking on my door, these Jehovah Witnesses. I'm like, come on in! And they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. And two hours later, they'd be like, can we go? I'm like, one more bottle of coffee. <laughs> That's a true story. But you know, I, um, the, the obsession of alcohol went away. I never had it again in 15 and a half years, no matter what happened to my life. Some devastating things have happened in my life. But do you know how I keep like that when I go to bed at night? <clears throat> I fill out this beautiful form, and I'd love to share it with you. Uh, this form that I have, <clears throat> if I could ever find it, it's called the 10-step form. And it's a 10-step form worksheet. And it's the questions right out of the book. I wrote them for you. Just fill it out. Okay? Wake up in the morning. The 11th step. We wake up in the morning. I'm with my wife. She's got a wonderful, beautiful Italian accent. <clears throat> and she reads her um, Al-Anon literature, which is absolutely beautiful. I read uh, my 24-hour book. I also, um, if you have a problem with uh, religious type of stuff, I also have every non-denominational prayer in my book right here in the page number in the paragraph it comes from. So we read three of those. And then I read something really beautiful <clears throat> from Science of the Mind over here. And I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to be able to read what I wanted to read to you. But um, this is uh, called The Center of Positive Living, and every religion is right. It's absolutely beautiful. It's called Science of the Mind. And so when we do that, when we're done, we set our alarm, and we put 15, 20, whatever, how many minutes we want to meditate in that morning, and then we get up. <clears throat> and then we go to the gym, because it's a mind, body, soul thing. It's not just all about AA anymore with me. It's all about the whole thing. I, you couldn't tell the gut, but I've got an Italian wife who cooks unbelievably. And you know, and now it's all about helping others. And on Saturdays, we sit there, and we wait for people to come in, and we bring them through the steps, and we have an unbelievable job. We have we have a career today that, you know, I don't fly anymore. I took an early retirement in 2004 and took my pension and started this little company that got huge and ended up selling to a wonderful Wall Street firm. And and um, and now we just have, you know, 3,000 employees. And we get to AA them without them even knowing they're being AA. And, um, you know, I have a life today I, I just, I could, uh, I could never fathom. I, I could never fathom. If you have not prayed and meditated with your wife or your significant other, I would, I would totally recommend it. It's awesome. It's off the hook cool. And um, it's just an honor to be here. And I thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.